Alina walked out of the airport and approached a taxi. There were many cars, and finding the right one among the identical yellow and white vehicles was difficult. She had completely become unaccustomed to her homeland, and did not immediately start speaking in her native language, occasionally mixing in English words. Alina walked to the taxi, got in after checking the car number. She wrapped herself in a warm scarf because it was much colder here than she had anticipated. The car started moving, and soon the huge airport, seemingly made entirely of glass, was left behind. Outside the window, landscapes dusted with freshly fallen snow were visible. She had forgotten that snow could fall here even in the middle of autumn. The man quietly turned on the radio, which she paid no attention to. Her head was full of the events of the last month, everything had happened too quickly. First, her father passed away, then the transfer of the company as an inheritance, and now a forced return to the country after six years of happy life abroad. She did not like her homeland, no matter how native it was to her. As soon as the plane lifted off from the runway, she immediately began to miss home. She wanted to return to her home state, her hometown, to the house she had bought six months ago, where her beloved dog and two cats lived, which the neighbor would now feed and walk. Alina got out of the taxi when it pulled up to the apartment building. The agent gave her the keys to the rented studio, received the rest of the payment, and disappeared. Alina did not plan to stay here long, she did not even plan to come, but the situation required her presence. She would either transfer the company to her brother or stay here herself. The latter option clearly did not appeal to her. After arriving, she settled into the new apartment almost immediately and called her brother, who was supposed to arrive in just half an hour. When Alexis pulled up to the building, she knew who was behind the wheel. Her brother was drawn to the trappings of a luxurious life, and sometimes it greatly detracted from his character. He adjusted his designer jacket and entered the building. She greeted him warmly. Max started unpacking the food he had brought with him and began the conversation. I didn't think you'd come so quickly, he said with a smile. But I'm really glad to see you. Though, it's noticeable that you're not particularly happy to be back home. But why am I surprised, Dad sent you abroad right after school, left you there, but at least you still speak Russian very clearly, even if you sometimes mix up words. Yes, it happens. You're right. Dad sent me out of the country at 16. He thought it would be safer for me there. At first, I was angry with him, but now I'm only grateful. For me, that's home, and this is all foreign now. And I speak Russian well because. Believe it or not, I read books aloud to my dog so as not to forget how to speak. I quickly started forgetting in the first year since there were few Russian speakers, and if there were any, everyone spoke in the local language. I want to go home, I hope everything will be over quickly. Tomorrow I need to go on business to the lawyers, and the day after tomorrow I will be in the office, she said, shrugging uncertainly. I don't know why dad left the business specifically to me. After all, he had Bella, who would have taken over perfectly. He trusted her as much as himself. And he loved you more, although. I haven't been here for so many years, I think I could easily miss something important. You haven't missed anything, the young man said, waving his hand. Dad went off the rails before he left, started redoing everything in the company. He used to make donations to funds before, but in the end, the amounts became huge. He always said that children's lives depended on him, that you can't just take everything for yourself, and so on. He left me two estates, one here, one in Spain, and this cosmetic factory. He left you the business and not a penny. And he left everything to his woman. That's our father for you. The young man said angrily, and his face twisted into a scornful grimace. She looked at him but said nothing. She hardly ever talked to her father about her brother. And the father did not really like to talk about him. Maybe a black cat ran between them. Or maybe the father really did go off the rails in his old age. In any case, when her brother left, the girl decided what to do next. She figured out the best way to see what was happening inside the company. 
The next day she entered with a pass, changed clothes, and pretended to be a new employee. No one could recognize her, simply because no one knew her face. She quickly settled in, and on the very first day, she managed not only to study the papers in horror and see that the company was in decline, but also to realize that her own brother intended to take everything away not just for nothing. And who would the entire company go to now? Alina wondered, standing by the coffee table in the lounge area. She struck up a conversation with Bella, the former deputy director. I don't know. I hope they shut us down altogether. Better that than to fall into the hands of that idiot Max. You wouldn't know, you were in a different branch. But when Roman Vasilievich passed away, Max entered the office like he owned the place. He stopped all donations to the foundation, he turned the accounting department upside down, nearly fired three departments to cut costs. For the two weeks he was bossing around here, until the lawyers arrived, I thought he would ruin everything. And now we're all in limbo. Bella said with a touch of melancholy in her voice. Only now did Alina start to realize with horror what awaited the company if she handed over control to Max Alina entered her father's office, and immediately felt melancholic. Nothing here had changed. The same mahogany, the same desk, the same bookcases with entire echelons of books. But something had indeed changed. Thick folders had appeared. Alina approached the folders, pulled one out, opened it, and was stunned. There were children's photos. First, a photo of a child at the beginning of an illness, then prescriptions, bills, and finally a photo of a healthy child. Alina jumped when she heard Bella's voice again. These are the children your father saved. I was informed that you came in with a pass, so no need to play games with me. But I'm glad you decided to impartially find out how everything is arranged here. You see, all these folders. Your father helped a lot, to be precise, and the company has already saved the lives of more than 100 children. And now, when your brother cut the funding, they simply have no chance left. I didn't know. I thought he did all this just for show, but here's the reality. And about my brother, I also knew nothing. I was very surprised when I learned that the company was left for me to manage. And I. Alina, listen, I know I have no right to give you any advice, but I ask you just to hear me out. She said, softening her tone. Please, don't hand the company over to your brother. Stay as the owner and just leave me as the director. Your father must have told you about me, and you must remember me. I worked side by side with your father for twenty years. This is our baby. It's our chance to change not only the world of information technology but also our chance to help those in need. Bella was nearly in tears. Alina, coming home, didn't even eat. She thought only about the company, her brother's actions, and many other things. She was disgusted with her own decision. But she dialed a familiar number and hired a private detective. She paid double to start the work immediately. Until midnight, she was in agony, worried that she was being too harsh on her brother. She believed Bella, remembered her, and remembered what her father had said about her. But her brother. That was a different story. She hardly knew him. He was always a mess. Even when she was in school, they rarely spoke because he was always hanging out somewhere. And now, could she hand the company over to him? But she couldn't stay here either. Every time Alina closed her eyes, she saw photos of sick children, whom her father and the company had almost snatched back from death's door. And now her brother had simply deprived the children of a chance. She wanted to do the right thing and follow her heart. But she was so tired that she could hardly think straight. Early in the morning, waking up, she barely remembered how she had fallen asleep. The girl pulled her laptop closer and started examining everything the private detective had sent her. She was stunned by what she saw. He had sent recordings of conversations, correspondences. Her brother was planning to sell the company in pieces to pay off his debts. He had apparently continued to gamble. 
hundreds of people would be left without jobs, and children without a chance for recovery. Their father's life's work would be gone, simply because he wanted to pay off debts. Alina quickly got ready and went to her father's lawyer, who knew the business inside out. She spent over three hours in the office, processing documents, signing various certificates, and making copies. She was in a hurry because, according to the calls and correspondence, it was a matter of minutes. Taking with her everything she could, including the lawyer, she went to the office where her brother was already waiting for her. Seeing her with the documents and the lawyer, Max was pleased. He stood there, rubbing his hands and smiling broadly. Bella looked miserable and depressed. Her hands dropped, she had lost all hope. And how could she hope for a girl who hadn't even been in the country for so many years, let alone the company? All right, let's sign, he said before they even entered the office. But let's make it quick, time is money, as they say. There's nothing to sign, Max, the girl said, turning to her brother. I know you have huge debts. I know you've gambled away almost all of your fortune. And you know what? I will not allow the life's work of my, our father to be sold off just because of your irresponsibility, she said, her gaze becoming stern. Are you stupid? You're going to stay in the country and manage a company you've never worked in. He laughed, placing a hand on his stomach. She noticed the bruises on his knuckles. No, I won't. Bella will. I've officially transferred not just the management, but the entire company to Bella. Now she is the rightful owner of our father's company. All its branches, and departments. Father would have been happy with this. She didn't finish her sentence, seeing the woman's face stretch in surprise and her brother's look turn to astonishment. He stormed out of the office, swearing angrily. She just looked after him and felt in her heart that she was doing the right thing. Alina, I don't even know how to thank you. But what about you? This is a huge fortune, Bella said, holding the papers. She still couldn't believe what was happening. You know, I have a good job there and my own house. I have a dog and two cats, I have friends and a home library. I'm happy. I don't need all that money. But they do, she said, nodding towards the shelf where the folders with photos of saved children were kept. She warmly said goodbye to Bella and bought a plane ticket that same day. Standing in the airport, Alina felt light and at peace. She smiled to herself, thinking that everything would now be all right. She felt she had made the right decision. She completed her registration and all the checks, sat in the waiting area looking through the glass panoramic windows at the departing planes. Soon, she would be on a plane again, and after several long hours, she would get into her friend's car, who would meet her, and they would go to her home. They would make delicious coffee, sit under a large oak tree, cover their legs with a checkered blanket, and just enjoy the autumn evening. Perhaps this was now far more important than the huge fortune that would now go to a good cause. Good cause. Good cause.